Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to this presentation of Criminal Injustice, a community conversation presented by the Carbondale Public Library and WSIU Public Broadcasting on behalf of Independent Lens. And this is also known as Indy Lens Pop-Up. So welcome again. Um, we are delighted to present this panel presentation from Illinois Humanities Grants participants. Uh, the grant is known as Envisioning Justice. Before we get started today, I wanna just give you a few tips to make the most of this pres presentation. First of all, you have both a chat box and a Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please make use of those boxes by clicking on them. If you use the chat box, you can introduce yourself to the panelists and to the rest of the audience and feel free to make comments. Uh, if you'd like, you can use the Q&A box when you have questions and we will try to address your questions through the presentation. Uh, you can raise your hand if you have technical problems. We do have a really astute technical staff with us today from the Carbondale Public Library. Jennifer and Diana are on hand to handle any kind of technical issues you may encounter and always be respectful of others uh, when you are sharing. Now this Indie Lens pop-up experience today is based on a film that will be broadcasting on PBS this coming Tuesday night at nine o'clock central. The film is Philly DA. It's an eight part docu-series and it has to do with the current district attorney who focuses on reform in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, this is a relatively new format for PBS and Independent Lens. And we are very pleased to share it with you. Uh, you can also watch uh, the film series through video streaming. And there is a link on your screen right now. There are also a number of online screenings available from public media stations around the country. And the schedule for those virtual presentations uh, is listed at that web link. And then if you would like a discussion guide, if you would like access to more information, resource links and films uh, from some of the photos from the film, you can access those on the wsiu.org website as you see on this screen. Now, if you want to revisit any of those web links later on, we can copy those into the chat and, and you're, you, know, you will have those at your fingertips a little bit later. But those are other ways to watch the film on which much of our conversation today is based. So now let's just take a quick peek at the official trailer for the film, Philly DA. You'll have to unmute Beth. Jennifer, can we restart please? Thank you. Okay, let's try this again with my microphone on and we it will start the video. I beg your pardon, I should not have shut myself off there. And Jennifer's getting this queued up. I rejected a long time ago that the only purpose of the criminal justice system is to punish. Voters in Philadelphia have chosen a progressive as their new district attorney. The most stunning upset. Sending political shockwaves across the country. I am a career civil rights lawyer, the only attorney in 
in the history of this city to overturn 800 convictions by corrupt police officers. Krasner is a hero to some and a bum to others. He's never been pro-law enforcement. If things aren't working from the inside, you need to bring someone from the outside. What do you think he's trying to accomplish? Anarchy. At this point, there are more people of color in prison or on parole than in slavery at the end of the Civil War. Larry is bringing in criminologists, activists. Everything we do, steady fire, heavy resistance. This will be controversial. Policies that focus on rehabilitation and second chances as opposed to punishment. We're in Philadelphia and there's murders and robberies. Community service is maybe not appropriate. This DA's office has been too close and too cozy with the Fraternal Order of Police. How corrupt do you think the city is? Anybody who's dealt with this office knows there are secrets. We need to find out where the secrets are. You gotta be kidding me. What is it? All about police officers. There has not been prosecution of police misconduct by this DA's office for 30 years. Right now, Philly police officers think the scales are suddenly weighed down in favor of criminals. If you're too corrupt to testify in court, you're too corrupt to patrol the streets. Who was DA when there were dozens of people shot over the weekend? I was. We're tired, and we want our neighborhood back! When you try to make the right decisions, I'll live with the rest. This is a meaningless, endless cycle. A cycle of trauma, a cycle of pain. Some of the effects can be irreversible. There's no mass incarceration. That's utterly ridiculous. Not one cop is going to tell you that he's on our team. Well, I suggest you don't shoot unarmed people in the back. The DA's office is not a place a social experiment should be conducted. You don't have to destroy the system to get the results you want. All right, thank you. And, um, once again, this begins on Tuesday, and I'd like to mention that our entire program this afternoon is streaming on Facebook Live. Thanks to Carbondale Public Library for making that happen. And let's get started to meet some of our guests uh, who all have a grant uh, as part of the Envisioning Justice Initiative from Illinois Humanities. Our first panelist, I'm delighted to say that I know this individual personally. Her name is Chastity Mays, and she is sharing a program about reimagining mass incarceration series. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Chastity Mays, and I am the assistant director of the Gift of Love Charity. And we started this project, um, Reimagining Mass Incarceration, before COVID. Um, we did get a grant from um, Illinois Humanities and Visiting Justice. And our original intent was, of course, to meet in person and have a, a conversation around reimagining mass incarceration. But we had to make some changes and pivot a little bit. So what we decided to do was create a documentary. So we're going to take four individuals and we're gonna film them and they're gonna talk about their personal experience with mass incarceration. Um, and we do ask that you give us grace. So this documentary thing is very new to us, um, but we're doing our very best. I had the opportunity to sit in um, with all of the participants who have participated so far and it has really impacted me personally, their stories. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about a gift of love charity. So we are an arts education and agricultural program organization. We are a nonprofit. We provide all of our services um, free of charge. So we, we would like everybody to be able to participate. So our vision is to educate the community so they gain knowledge of the arts, education and agricultural programs. And this allows them to see a future for themselves far beyond what they can imagine. Um, we definitely have enjoyed everything we've did in the Southern Illinois community and we hope to continue our work. So we do have a trailer for you and um, we hope you enjoy.
when you have that that much time if you're not strong mentally it it eats away at you and and inmates hang themselves um, and he says you know there's, there's these big guys in there um, that hang themselves because they can't deal with the time and, and the environment and um, the conditions. Sad to say, before I was out of high school, all my friends were arrested. They started going to prison. Uh, they didn't even get to graduate from high school. So I always remember that. And then some were murdered or some, you know, so, I, and I always think back, like, what could we do different back then to avoid that situation? But it was nothing we could have did. It was what our parents should have did. It was what our community should have did. He shouldn't have been around us. I met an abundance of brothers who had a very similar story like mine. I met some innocent brothers. I met some brothers that did no wrong according to not doing nothing, but, uh, but according to the law, they was foul. So that was our trailer um, to our documentary that will be coming. Um, it should be available by August of this year. Um, we still have some finishing up to do with some participants. We also have a YouTube channel um, that everybody will be able to go to and watch um, the um, completed project once it is finished. We are actually also working on a project right now. Um, we got a Healing Illinois grant and um, we focused that on sh um, people sharing their stories with racism. So starting June, of this year everyone will be able to see the individual stories for that documentary and if anybody would like to see that documentary in full and have a discussion around it i do ask that you contact me but we would like people to go to our youtube channel and check out our work and look forward to um, the project being finished in august and i'm I, we're just honored that we were asked to be a part of this discussion we thank you so much Okay, um, thank you, Chastity. Jennifer has put a link to that information on, in the chat box. Um, so if, if you would like to get a hold of that information, check your chat box. Um, we're really pleased that a gift of love charity is working in our local area here in Southern Illinois. And now we're going to actually meet a new panelist. Um, her name is Sherry Stone Mediatore. Um, she is from further north in the state of Illinois and is sharing about stories for freedom, preparing and sharing testimony of people impacted by extreme sentencing. Sherry? Thank you, I'm honored to be part of this discussion. I'd like to say a little bit about Pro Illinois, the organization that I'm doing my, or we are doing this Envisioning Justice grant with, and then I'll um, talk about how the Envisioning Justice project is vital to our work. Pro Illinois is unique among Illinois criminal justice groups in that it was founded and continues to be led by a group of men at Stateville Prison with life sentences. They formed Parole Illinois to address a human rights crisis in our prisons that has been overlooked by many reform efforts. It's a crisis that some of us call the crisis of death by incarceration. As you probably know, Illinois no longer has a death penalty. However, in 1978, Illinois eliminated discretionary parole, which was the only regular mechanism to review people with long sentences for early release. Thus the state effectively instituted another, instituted another kind of death penalty, life without parole sentences. We call it death by incarceration because it's basically a kind of drawn out death row. 
To make matters worse, in the decades following the elimination of parole, tough on crime politicians operating under the now discredited theory that harsher sentences would deter crimes, piled on sentencing increase after sentencing increase so that people are now sentenced to double and sometimes triple the amount of prison time for the same crimes. As a result, Illinois courts now settle hundreds of people every year with sentences that require them to spend the rest of their lives behind bars. Currently over 5,000 people in the Illinois Department of Corrections carry such death by incarceration sentences. No matter how much they transform their lives, no matter how ready they are to give back to their communities, they remain trapped in a system that has virtually no mechanism to review them for release. For those of us in the humanities, this raises the question, what kind of human attitude, what kind of human mode of being in the world has allowed us to lock up and throw away the key on thousands of our fellow human beings and call this justice? Some critics have attributed this hyperpunitive mindset to a tough on crime narrative that was popularized in the 80s that draws a stark division between so-called honest Americans and so-called monster criminals. It casts the well-being of honest citizens as dependent on locking up and walling off criminal others. For instance, in his famous 1993 speech for the crime bill, then Senator Joe Biden warned that predators on our street born out of wedlock must be cordoned off from the rest of society, away from my mother, your husband, our families. Importantly, this tough on crime narrative isn't only a conceptual scheme that rationalizes mass incarceration of the urban poor and of any people who don't fit the racialized gender norm of the American citizen. In addition, for many Americans, this tough on crime narrative is a way of anchoring our identities and orienting ourselves in the world. It gets hold of us on a deep psychological and effective level in such a way that shores up our conceptions of ourselves as good guys rather than bad guys and affects the very way that we see and open up our senses to other human beings. In effect, it thwarts any meaningful seeing or human responsiveness to people who have been labeled criminal. In this context, facts are often futile to change attitudes. For instance, facts about the low recidivism rates of people who have been car incarcerated for long periods, facts about the failure of deterrence theory that is the finding that longer sentences actually do not deter crime, and facts about human brain development that tell us that the brain doesn't fully develop until people are 25 and that people age out of crime as they get older, all of these facts have little force against the visceral reaction that stereotypes of criminals evoke in us and against the appealing, even if dishonest, moral righteousness that the fight against crime affords many of us. Our Envisioning Justice Project, Stories for Freedom, is an attempt to reach the public and policymakers on a deep level of perception and affect so that stereotypes and moral havens notwithstanding, more people might be able to see people with long sentences as human beings. To do this, we have a multi-step um, approach of cultivating and spreading stories from people who have been directly impacted. First, we're holding testimony workshops for people who have been directly impacted by extreme sentencing, including formerly incarcerated people and family members and loved ones of incarcerated people. At these workshops, we discuss strategy, strategies for humanizing our friends and loved ones. We practice telling stories, such as stories of the relationships that we've maintained with incarcerated loved ones and friends, and stories of people's struggles to not let one tragic act define them and to do their best to give back to their communities, and stories how of when people were incarcerated, their fellow incarcerated friends counseled and supported them while they were in prison. We also are creating opportunities for workshop participants to share their stories at press conferences, universities, churches, and meetings with legislators. We hold post-testimony reflection on what works um, and doesn't for specific audiences. One lesson we've learned is that testimony is a relationship. And it's most effective when the audience can find a point of connection with the person giving testimony, even if it's just something like they're both being mothers or both sharing a faith background. Sometimes that makes the audience more willing to enter the world of the storyteller. And we also are creating a video of this testimony. We are excited that we just hired an Emmy award winning documentary filmmaker to film the testimony. Fortunately, he believes in our cause and he's going to give us an abolitionist discount. 
Um, by showing this film to community groups of various kinds, we hope to help more people see our incarcerated friends and loved ones from the standpoint of people who love them. And we hope to displace discussions of how we can protect us good guys from the bad guys and replace those discussions with, with how do we reap the full potential of our brothers, sisters, dads, sons, friends, and loved ones who have been locked up for years, but who have so much to give back to our families and communities. We um, haven't yet um, begun the film, but a young assistant of ours did an informal recording of an excerpt from one of our panel discussions. It's about a minute and a half, so if we have time for that, um, I'll end by showing the this um, just sort of informally produced excerpt of some of the testimony. Parole Illinois is focused on the topic of long-term incarceration, and we're focused on the people who um, will likely die in prison. If Excuse we me, but it should just be the last minute and a half. The last, it should start at the last minute and a half. There's a whole thing. Oh no, I didn't want to show this. Awful. Okay. My brother, Jeremiah Betts, and my husband, Manuel Metlock, are currently incarcerated serving de facto life sentences. They continually work to be better students, you know, educate themselves, be parents. They have maintained family connections with us here on the outside. They don't forget any birthdays. They remember all the anniversaries. I am here today to uh, change the narrative around uh, violent offenders. The counter narrative of uh, people being bad in there, but usually it's people helping people. And it's just human nature to do so. And uh, uh, it's important to understand that, you know, these are individuals and not just, uh, uh, people that we throw away because we, we place upon them a label. I can remember the first time I went to Stateville to visit Jeremiah. And it was difficult even just getting through. And when I got upstairs to where he was, I collapsed in his arms. So I can imagine what's gonna happen when he is physically home, but there will be a lot of praying, a lot of hugging, um, anything he thinks he wants to have to eat, we'll be prepared. I know it's going to happen and I am going to be so grateful and I'm, I'm so proud of what you guys are doing. And I just thank you all so much. I just wanted to say that I thank you for what you do. Okay, Sherry, anything else? No, thank you so much. All right, I appreciate what you had to say about relationships and emphasizing that along with the human potential. So I look forward to the question and answer session that will be coming up. But right now we're gonna move on to the next set of panelists. I am pleased to um, present Lori Jo Reynolds and Terrence Chisholm in Meet the Chicago 400, Lessons in the Carceral State. Hi, thank you so much. I believe Terrence is going to start. Go ahead, Terrence. I think Terrence is having difficulty hearing. Hello, I, di I didn't know if okay, I was on yet. Can you hear me? Oh, um, good afternoon. I'm Terrence Susan. I'm the president of the Chicago 400. And the organization I'm in 
we are dealing um homeless people in housing protection law. Because of that, we are forced to leave our home. Um, just a quick introduction of myself. I'm 37 years old. I have two sons. I'm a full time gospel. Um, my conviction was in 2008. I did um, so like 17 years. Um, I only did jail time on probation. Upon my release, I was forced to leave my home. And this is causing me to uh, be without a place as we speak now. Um, just like myself and other people in the Chicago 400, we are asking um, for help to um, in housing against me, also in weekly. Um, weekly is where we go see the police once a week, kind of piece of paper saying where we stay there at the, um, for the past seven days. And it's... Um, I'm sorry, Terrence, I feel like your volume is quite low. Can you talk louder? Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's much better. I don't know if you want to start over, but it was hard to hear you before. I think you can keep talking. Sure, I can start over. <laughs> oh, um, I was saying um, that um, my conviction has been 17 years now, and um, up to this point, um, dealing with um, registration, I have to go see the police. Um, one time out of a day on a Thursday, and it's really affecting us, especially when you have kids that you have to um, constantly ask questions or they ask the questions on to is you coming home or why you have to go to the police um, every week. And it's, ment it's a mis mentally and physically aspect. And we are asking for change um, with these laws. Because um, we don't serve by time, we just trying to be better parents and have a separate chance. Once again, thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. I really wanted you to be able to hear Terrence's story louder. Um, so I'm going to just give a little presentation um, and I'm gonna put that on right now. Uh, let's see. Oh, hmm. Okay. So I don't know if you could hear that carefully what Terrence said, but the Chicago 400 are the people that are listed on public conviction registries who are experiencing homelessness, who therefore have to register weekly. Um, and this is what that looks like at the Chicago police station where people are lined up. Um, and I just also wanted to say that the images that we're showing here in this PowerPoint um, came because the Chicago 400 did a show at the drawing center in New York last year. Um, and so they did this, these incredible images. Um, the premise of all of our work is that our criminal justice policy should prevent victimization, support survivors, hold people accountable for harm, and then after punishment, let people rebuild and move on with their lives. And to make sure that's happening, our policy should be evidence-based. Um, and what Terrence was addressing and what the campaign is addressing is the acute crisis caused by residency restrictions. And these are discredited policies that permanently exclude people and very disproportionately black men from most housing for life. And by barring people from nearly all housing, we have had this incredibly shocking impact on the state of Illinois. We force hundreds of Chicagoans into homelessness. And each year we also keep some 1400 people stuck in prison past their out dates, past their release dates. They're ready to be released um, because you can't leave prison if you're homeless. We don't let people leave prison and go on MSR if they're homeless. And the amazing thing is that we're forcing this on people who have homes to go to. Terrence had a home and we made him homeless. Um, many people have safe and welcome homes 
with their kids, with their, with their spouses, with their moms, you know, with their cousins, et cetera. But our state laws have made their housing options a crime. Um, and so I wanted to just mention that. And the other main thing that the campaign is addressing, and we're doing this through a series of webinars where we have much better audio and, and more people, um, but we're also addressing public conviction registries and really helping people understand how all the systems that our fellow panelists are talking about today are connected. And when someone is released from prison, um, many people are put on public conviction registries. So these are just laws that require the police to collect personal data and photos from people simply because they have a past criminal conviction and then put all that information on the internet. And there is an entire police apparatus to collect all this data called registration, where people have to show up at the police station annually or quarterly and give their data to the police. And if you're homeless, you have to do that 52 times a year, which is really difficult experiencing the hardship of, of homelessness. Um, so it's really important to see registries as a police project. Um, uh, we're moving people by the tens of thousands to police stations and moving police by the tens of thousands into domestic spaces just to see you know, if you listed your address correctly. So registries require people with past convictions, free people, people who have already served their time and been punished um, to, you know, to have this ongoing adversarial relationship with police after punishment is complete for decades or for life. Um, so Terrence has now been homeless some 17 years and most of the people in the Chicago 400 who are homeless had convictions in the 90s, you know, in the 2000s, 10 years ago, and they can never get out of the web of the criminal justice system um, because it becomes uh, an engine of police contact and therefore re-arrest, re-incarceration and a huge expansion of the carceral state. And just to put this in a little bit of um, more context, 47% um, of Illinoisans have con con arrest or conviction re records. Um, and people have kind of tried to sell these registries as public safety, but how can they be public safety? Um, we're really just listing people with convictions on the internet. We now have um, um, uh, violent offenses against youth registry, murder registry, gun registry, methamphetamine manufacturing, arson, and of course the sex offense registry. Um, but gun violence, sexual violence, domestic violence, robbery, child neglect, child abuse are not prevented by listing people with convictions on the internet. And so our campaign um, is bringing together crime survivors, housing advocates, treatment providers, police accountability activists, et cetera, um, people committed to racial equity to work together to support the Chicago 400 in challenging these laws. And another big component of these laws, once you start doing this, having public conviction registries, um, is that, of course, we're seeing incredible rates of people listed on public conviction registries and especially high rates of black men. Um, so one in 212 men in our state are listed on the sex offense registry now, one in 84 black men are listed on the sex offense registry in our state. And if you look at all the public conviction registries, one in 400, uh, excuse me, one in 145 men are listed on some public conviction registry and one in 42 black men. And this is very similar to what happened with mass incarceration where suddenly in 2008, Pew came out and realized um, we have so many people in prison. We have one in a hundred people in prison. And now what we're seeing is we have, we're just have so many people on registries. And I just wanted to show one more thing to, um, this is what housing banishment looks like in the city of Chicago. This is how much land is blocked off from people after conviction for the rest of their lives. So one fifth of the people on the registry in Chicago are homeless. 80% of those homeless are black men and 80%, you know, those who are homeless are the Chicago 400. And most had stable housing until the banishment zone, uh, zones shifted. And then their housing suddenly became illegal. And most have also already been rearrested and sent to prison for a failure to follow one of these administrative re reporting requirements. Um, and what the Chicago 400 asked people to realize is that they carry the laws out. This is this wonderful 
a seven foot drawing, we carry the law out and um, asking people to stand up for them on Twitter, especially would be helpful, um, but also to just join the campaign. And that's the whole premise of the Chicago 400, that here's some of the Chicago 400 lobbying in Springfield, that they're lobbying for their children. This is our bill sponsor last year. Um, they're lobbying for their children and their futures. And this is a positive thing. People want to have housing and nobody, we, our state should not be forcing people out of housing. Our state should not be forcing people to go to the police station once a week. So thank you very much. Right, fascinating. Fascinating, Laurie and Terrence. Appreciate that picture. Thank you for shining light on this very complex issue. Um, my heart goes out to the homeless everywhere, including those who are without a home here in Southern Illinois. Now let's, uh, I'm sure a lot of people are gonna have questions. So let's move on to our next panelist. Kira Rogers is here and she is going to share about creation of a restorative justice hub in Decatur. Kira. All right, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And um, to the speakers who have all, you know, been speaking before me, um, excellent job. It's just, you know, this is such a, a wealth of information that I think everybody can can really learn from and benefit um, just from, from hearing and, and seeing how this work is impacting everyone um, directly, indirectly, whether you thought it was or not, you could at least hear how it is uh, affecting uh, those around you. So I want to just do a short little introduction uh, of just, you know, for, for this initiative called the Global Restorative Justice Partnership, um, the GRJP for short, and I'm going to post some information about this GRJP. And so uh, my name is, is Kira Rogers, and I am the Director of Criminal Justice at Millican University in Decatur, Illinois. It's central Illinois, like right smack dab in the middle of the state. Um, and we are focusing on ways to, you know, really just kind of help um, our area in particular and uh, to, to focus more on restorative justice initiatives and practices and things like that, but also how we can sort of uh, focus on things globally uh, around the world as well. Um, we have so many global partners that have been uh, just kind of having these conversations about restorative justice and what this means and how people have been impacted. For instance, we're talking about mass incarceration and ending mass incarceration. Um, you, you know, in Illinois, we've recently had a lot of law changes um, in, in regards to the criminal justice system as a whole. We've had we've been impacted by these things quite a bit. And so people have asked questions, and I'm sure you have too, where you will ask, like, well, what's next? What's coming next? What does this mean? Um, and so if we really think about, you know, how it like, why are the laws changing? Why now? Right. And so one of the things that we uh, discuss quite a bit, my colleagues and I all around the world, and I'll introduce uh, the website here in just a second, so you can see kind of where we're from and what we're doing. Um, but the the conversations that have happened, you know, are, are around criminal justice reform, they're not just happening in the state of Illinois; they're happening everywhere. Um, and people uh, all over the world are actually paying attention in ways like never before because we now live in a digital world, right? We can connect with people all over um, in a matter of minutes. And so this is a situation where we now can have these conversations about how someone being incarcerated for the last 25 years, how they are returning home and only to find out that, you know, they were actually innocent. So now what, you know, and, and how do we actually, um, how do we progress and move forward with things that, that were going on, um, you know, back in, the, in, in 20, 30, 40 years ago to what it is that we see now. Um, and so we will be spending some time as this, this global restorative justice partnership is beginning to, to, to gain some traction here. We are spending some time getting to, to understand in our individual areas what it is that needs to happen to introduce a space where people can talk about how they've been impacted by incarceration, whether it's jail or prison or both. Um, how the laws and how the laws are enforced have actually impacted them as individuals and their families. Um, we are discussing how, as, as we heard our very first speaker today, um, as, as you know, Sherry was discussing as well, like how it is that 
you know, the, the laws from the get tough on crime approach, how we're still suffering from the symptoms of those things. And, um, you know, how we've really never recovered, even though the, the, the country has, has said that we were moving away from the get tough on crime approach into a more restorative, yet the restorative still kind of felt like punitive. And so that's the reason why there's m much more discussion happening about um, how it is that we need to be focusing our attention on how to improve our laws and our justice systems and our policies in our areas. So I'm gonna share my screen and show this particular website um, that is introducing an upcoming conference for the Global Restorative Justice uh, Partnership. And the theme for this particular conference, it's called Care Over Punishment. It's a global call to action. And in, you can register now. We do have scholarships available for anyone that wants to attend. These scholarships will allow you to register for free. Um, in fact, if anybody wants a scholarship, just feel free to go ahead and ask for one and we will allow you to attend this, this conference for free. So um, this, this is gonna take place. It's a half day event on the 21st and the 22nd um, from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And those of us that are right here in Illinois, we are in Central Time, so it's one to five for us. And the point of this particular conference is to really focus on critical issues in public policy, criminal justice, re-entry, those coming home from prison, right? Um, social justice, expungement, deflection, diversion, restorative justice, community-based program development, and all of this from a global standpoint. And at the end of this conference, we will actually have a global call to action, which is where we're going to have time to uh, basically introduce these global cafe tables where you can come and learn from others and you can network with others from all around the world mm -hmm. to introduce um, perhaps new information to your areas or you can learn from other areas to figure out what it is that we need to do to improve our systems or our policies in our in our individual uh, communities. And so um, one of the things that we have really just been super, super proud of is the fact that we had so many from all over the world who have actually said, sign us up, we'll be there. Um, we are hearing from Asia, New Zealand, Mexico, Africa, Northern Ireland, England, the US, of course, Spain, California, Hawaii, Brazil, Singapore, it's, it's the World Congress, the National Association of Community and Restorative Justice, also known as NACRJ. Um, we have our speakers that are already lined up and we're trying to introduce speakers from, and I'll show you the, um, the actual event. Well, this is the event itself, but I'll show you um, just the, the conference details. Here's the schedule. The point is to introduce restorative justice a space to heal, a place to actually develop your own community-based hubs where we could dis we can discuss restorative justice um, and also discussing the impacts of how the criminal justice effective the criminal justice system has affected each one of us, whether directly or indirectly. The global cafe tables are going to be part of this particular conference as well, where you can come and learn and listen. We were talking about the art of storytelling a little earlier, right? This is the beauty of having a global conference where you can actually have the space to talk to others. So you will see, uh, you know, just as you can go through the list and I'll, I'll, I'll let everybody scroll uh, on your time as well, but um, just kind of having the space to hear uh, 40 minute presentations from people all over to discuss what it is that we see in academia, what are we seeing in practice, how we merge the two, and actually how we, we move forward with, with this call to action and what comes next. We often have those feel good moments, right? Where people get together and they discuss, um, you know, how this is all looking right now. And we feel good for the, for the moment that we're in, but then things kind of fall off afterwards. Right, so this is all about how we get together and 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 pull things together all you know to to move forward. So you will see here, and I wanted to just kind of show this history of this GRJP and really kind of where we started. Uh, right after the George Floyd case, um, we were discussing the the hurt and the pain that the communities were feeling and that people were actually thinking uh, in, in terms of you know what comes next for us as a country. And to see the whole entire world mobilize about the injustices that we're flat out just sick of, 
um, and we need better responses from a public standpoint um, to see the whole world mobilize about these things. This is where this entire initiative came from. So this new agency, hashtag GRJP2021, this new particular agency is, is definitely focusing on ways to um, promote restorative justice all around the world and in our individual practices within our communities. Um, and so you can see our vision and our mission uh, here on screen. And then we also have a growing board of directors. I have to update this website because we've had a few more over the past couple of days to say, sign us up. Um, so here you will see uh, you know, the individuals that have come together and, and right here in Decatur, Illinois. And then also too, we have Washington, DC, uh, we have Hawaii, <laughs> we have Kathmandu, Nepal, um, we also have another individual from Hawaii, and then we have a few fr from just the World Congress, um, other speakers that are going to be attending, so I just want to show you just a little bit about them. Um, this is Cedric Valsard from the World Congress, he's over in France, and he's going to be joining our board as well, and he works with over 10,000 practitioners all around the world. Uh, to come together to discuss criminal justice and public policy and advocacy for those who are coming home, those who are affected by unfair laws and policies that have existed, those who have been impacted by the othering that has taken place. It's the sense of us versus them, right? The othering. Um, this is what they discuss in these particular meetings. Um, and so we will just have a few others as far as keynote speakers, um, you know, those that have uh, that have really been doing this work for the last 20, 30, and 40 years. So you we, you might have heard uh, Kay Pranis, you might have heard of Dr. Bakisha, but that's basically what it is that we are gonna be doing at this particular conference. So registration has been open since the first. Um, and again, this conference is beginning in just a few days. So feel free to join us. Uh, we were gonna, we're gonna be posting information about upcoming webinars, trainings, workshops. We will also be posting any kind of publications and any new, um, we actually, we have others too that are very interested in the documentaries and different docu-series that occur as well. So we'll be posting that information on the site as well as a schedule of events of different things that will be coming up. But the whole focus, as you as you can see on the very first part of this, um, uh, the very first part of this website, the whole focus is to discuss uh, what it is that we, it's our responsibility, what it is that we are responsible for to change our policies, our, our outcomes, our laws, our programs. This is on us. We are responsible. And so if you ever want to just kind of see what we're up to, feel free to log into, uh, to, to, to join the site and also um, join us, GRJP Connect. Um, enter your email and hit the subscribe button and we will send you uh, monthly updates uh, just to see what we're up to in any way that you can get involved. So the point of getting involved is to, again, hear what's going on around you and see if you, if you ever want to get involved. We now have a global space where we can do this. And it doesn't matter what area you, you live in. So um, I'll stop the share because I can go on, on and on and on for this. So please feel free to, <laughs> to uh, reach out if you have questions. Um, our contact information is also on that particular website. And again, it is grjp.org. So feel free to, to join us and reach out and, and uh, hopefully we can become partners. So thank you so much for this time to share this. Great, Kira. I'm so glad to know about the work that you're doing to advance the culture of care in our world. I think it's so impressive that you've pulled this conference together that brings experts from around the world. Um, so I intend to visit your website and follow up after our meeting today. Thank you. Next, we're gonna move on and meet Shez Rumpf and Larry Burnett, who are speaking about downstate convening on higher education in prison. Um, <laughs> hello everybody. My name is Larry Barrett. Um, I'm here. I'm here with my uh, my colleague Chaz Rump. We are a part of the Illinois Coalition for Higher Education in Prison. Um, and I guess I can kick it to you, Chaz. 
Thanks, Larry. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you um, for the invitation. And it's been awesome to hear all the other presenters, um, some of the organizations Larry and I know well and work with, um, and others that are new. So this is really exciting. And we're, I think we're both humbled to be here. Um, so what we wanted to do today was talk a little bit about uh, what ILCHEP does and the importance of higher education in prison, um, and then specifically talk about the Envisioning Justice grant that is supporting our work to um, host a downstate convening specifically on higher education in prison. Larry, did you want to start with the education um, piece and why it's important, or you want me to keep going? You can, you can keep going for one second, Sarah. Okay, okay. Um, well, so one of the things that I'll, I'll just first share the mission here of ILCHEP. Um, so we're a coalition of programs and educators dedicated to providing quality higher education opportunities for people who are incarcerated throughout Illinois. And we strive to support our students as they build meaningful lives and prepare for a successful future in civic life. And equally important, and I love this part of the mission, um, is we encourage public dialogue and action to reduce our state's and country's reliance on incarceration. Um, so we're explicitly focused on decarceration um, in addition to providing education um, inside Illinois' uh, correctional facilities. Oh. Bit of a misnomer, prisons is a, is a bit, much better word. Um, oh, I do you wanna go, Larry? Yeah, I can go. Um, and so we feel like, um, Education in prison, uh, or higher education in prison, is important because it allows for uh, individuals like myself. I was, I'm formerly incarcerated. I did, uh, I did approximately about 13 years in prison. Um, I was locked up at the age of 21, and so during that time, I was, I was afforded the opportunity to be able to um, attend higher education in prison program. And it was, and it was during that time where I was able to reflect upon who. I was and started to map out who I wanted to become. And so this isn't an opportunity. Well, a lot of people have this misnomer of um, higher education being a place where um, a group of people come to be able to save a person's life. Well, that's, for me and the people that I know and that come to know, that's not the case. It seems it's, it's, um, it's more along the lines of people are already um, beginning to um, develop these skills and it's just a place to showcase these skills off. And so then I kick it back to Chaz. Yeah, and I really always appreciate how Larry foregrounds that, um, that there can be a lot of problems in terms of doing this work, especially around higher ed and prison with, um, you know, folks sweeping in and having the savior complex or, you know, think that they're, um, you know, gonna transform the lives of incarcerated people. Um, incarcerated people don't need that. Uh, they need resources, they need um, humanization, they need access to um, resources. And so really what we see from ILCHEP is that higher education in, in prison is a way um, to do all those things. And I think more specifically to connect to um, what some of the other presenters have said already, there's already been this theme about the importance of relationships and the importance of humanizing folks that are incarcerated or formerly incarcerated. Um, and I think I, I'm someone who teaches one class um, through Benedictine University at Sheridan Prison, which is a medium security men's prison. Um, and certainly the heart of what I'm trying to do is build relationships, make connection, um, and provide a humanizing space uh, that recognizes incarcerated people for who they are, for people with ideas, goals, visions, um, and to do that work in a space, as we've heard, that is inherently violent and dehumanizing. Um, and I think to kind of just note some of the other concerns that have come up in the chat and that people have addressed already, the trick is to try to figure out how to do that work without becoming an appendage of the carceral state, um, without just becoming this uh, place that's seen as a resource provider or making prisons a little bit nicer. Um, that certainly isn't what education in prison is about. Um, and so with ILCHEP, we have some of these big values um, and ethics that we are trying to uphold. Um, and we do that by bringing together programs throughout the state that are providing higher education in prison, supporting one another, troubleshooting problems that come up all the time with Illinois Department of Corrections in terms of students getting access to our classes, access to the materials that they need. Um, and so through the coalition, we're doing very practical work every day of trying to support one another, as well as students coming out of prison, as well as students that are still inside. Yeah, and I think uh, one of the things is that came out of the coalition coming together and about um, one of the 
um, I want to say roadblocks or impediments that we ran into with IDOC was this whole um, incident of censorship. So just to make a long story short, there was um, several books, probably several hundred books that were taken out of a library um, in Central Illinois, one of the Central Illinois prisons. And there was a campaign started called Freedom to Learn. And um, as a result of this, um, we have mobilized uh, this campaign leg of um, or arm of uh, LCHIP to be able to ensure that access to higher education is for all incarcerated people in all of Illinois. And so with that, I'd like to transition to what we envision um, this justice project downstate convening to look like uh, for higher education in prison. So the purpose of this is to basically to extend our hand from Northern, Northern Illinois to Southern Illinois. And I know that's a very long distance but we have very long arms. Um, <laughs> and the goal, the goal of this is just to make our, uh, our coalition stronger, to be able to make sure that uh, programs um, in Southern Illinois have the support in order to, uh, and to uh, ensure that they are able to um, give the best education for all incarcerated people. And that we um, appreciate that. And we uh, look forward to working with people and just building community. And so specifically, just to build on what Larry said, um, what the Envisioning Justice Project Grant from Illinois Humanities is helping us do um, is to bring together, um, hopefully, educators from around the state. So we feel like we've learned some really important lessons, um, groups like PNAP, uh, Education Justice Project, um, uh, North Park University, Augustana University, the little work I'm doing at Benedictine University, DePaul University. So there's a lot of schools um, that have made some inroads and we've, we've learned some hard lessons. And so we think we're in a position where we can hopefully share some of those lessons, um, help people with navigating the bureaucracy of university systems uh, to make sure that we're doing this work in an ethical way that truly benefits students um, and doesn't just make our universities look good. Um, and also navigating the Illinois Department of corrections um, and we truly believe that we have more power and more leverage when we're a united voice um, a coalition of higher educators uh, current and former students um, as opposed to individual programs that are trying to make inroads at each individual institution um, around the state. And so we do think the convening is gonna be an opportunity, uh, like Larry said, to expand our work, um, but more importantly, to make sure that, um, you know, especially with Pell Grants coming back, this is something Larry and I both wanted to mention, this is an incredible opportunity um, you know, and I think as Sherry and Lori Joe are both speaking about, like we're kind of maybe feeling this moment of turning turning back a little bit on all of these awful retributive uh, punitive policies. Um, so this is a moment of great hope and possibility, um, but there are also deep pitfalls that we need to be vigilant and guard against. Um, so such as folks kind of getting into higher ed and prison, um, just to use this as a revenue stream, as I mentioned before, to make their universities look good and get PR. And so we always wanna make sure um, that we're not treating students as numbers, um, that we're treating students who are inside and outside as people, um, as students who are smart, who have skills and who like any other student believes in their education and just needs support and guidance so that they can do the work and grow. Um, so we are excited to partner with folks from throughout the state. I'm seeing things in the chat. Um, I'll definitely, yes, I've been jotting down everyone's information. Um, and like Larry said, we'll, we'll um, be having this series of events building to, I think I might've just stole your thunder, Larry, <laughs> building to a big convening. No, I mean, I mean, just to, um, yeah, just to put it all a nice bow on it. I mean, we look forward to building um, what we, I mean, what people have termed. I ain't gonna say we, we created the term, but this um, this prison to school pipeline and just prison to love pipeline. Like what 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 we think of and what we envision is to be able to be able to support uh, people while they're incarcerated and give them the necessary tools that they need to survive in life. Like education is a right and not a, uh, not a, um, a, a choice or some a privilege rather, that's the word I'm looking for. And so we strongly um, stand on those uh, values. And so we just look forward to like connecting with the people in Southern Illinois. And I for one would just love to thank um, the Illinois Humanities for the grant that they gave us 
And I'll also like to thank the Carbondale Public Library and also Independent Lens and everyone else for tuning in and just for all the love and um, excitement that, that's going on. Okay, thank you so much for your presentation, Chez and Larry. And uh, I'm all about creating academic bridges into the community and helping to transform our, our world. So with that, I, I wanna kind of put the spotlight now on a very important organization for us in this region of Southern Illinois, and it's Southern Illinois Community Foundation. I'd like to just preface this by saying that uh, this is a historically rather poor rural area, and we don't have many philanthropic organizations. Unlike Chicago and major uh, urban centers around the United States, um, philanthropy is a little bit hard to come by as it's institutionalized in our region. So we are so grateful to have the Southern Illinois Community Foundation it's a um, fairly new um, kind of organization. And with us today is the executive director, Byram Fager. And Byram's gonna talk about SICF involvement in this uh, grant program. And he is going to lead our Q&A session this afternoon. So thank you, Byram. Thank you, Beth, and, and thank you everyone. Uh, for being on here today. Um, so the Southern Illinois Community Foundation is focused in the 17 southernmost counties of Illinois. And so I just put in the chat box myself that uh, for Illinois CHAP and uh, GRP and, and actually all the panelists, we are definitely a partner uh, that is willing and, and able to participate with you. Even, even Chastity Mays today, even though we're here not too far from each other is the first day that I've got to, uh, I can't say meet her in person, but I got to see her and she, you know, we've talked just a little bit on the phone, but uh, uh, we definitely are here to help with these type of community convening events and, and figuring out how to get more people together. Um, the other thing I would say is for us with the Illinois Humanities, we received a grant as well to do something that we had started last year called Community Conversations. Um, and these are events much like this today where we're having conversations on some topics that are basically uncomfortable, but the only way for us to move forward is to have these conversations, to have them with our friends, our neighbors, and with others who have experienced things that I, I don't know how to relate to without having it explained and having to be able to have that conversation. Um, and it, it for me, a, a big part of this is the education. So, um, you know, there's so many things that have been talked about today, and, and we have a ton of terms, you know, with mass incarceration, restorative justice, um, all of these different terms that if I only rely on social media, then I'm going to fail to understand. Um, even, even a concept, and, and I'll just take a second to, for something like Black Lives Matter. It, it, it probably took me, I, I'm sad to say, five or six months to truly understand it because it took someone on one of our community conversation discussions to say something you know, when we cheer for, you know, when you campaign against breast cancer, it doesn't mean all other types of cancer are not important. It just means today we're focusing on that. And so that was an aha moment for me. And I'm sorry to say it took that long, but it's like that's Black Lives Matter does not diminish anything else, but we have to have a focus on something like this so that we can try to make a difference. Um, and so talking just a little bit since today we were brought together also by the Philly DA project. Um, I think there's a lot of, you know, getting a chance to preview the first two episodes. I'm looking forward to getting to see it live on uh, starting this Tuesday and Wednesday with the, the broadcast. But there's a lot of things that in that really need to help us. I think that we need to educate ourselves even further so we can, we don't have to rely on Facebook. So um, a couple of questions that did come up, even talking about banishment zones. Um, and I think if, if uh, Lori or someone from the Chicago 400 could give us just a second to talk, you know, you, you, lit, you lit up a lot of stuff on that map of banishment zones, but can you give us just a little more detail about what is that? 
Sure, Terrence, are you available to do that or do you want me to do that? So I showed you a map with circles around it. Um, and so the idea behind a banishment zone, Terrence, you can pipe up as soon as, as, soon as you're ready, um, is that people are restricted from 500 feet of living, which is almost two blocks um, of, of any kind of regularly spaced public goods, such as a park, a daycare, a school, um, uh, a home daycare, a place where somebody's taken out a daycare license. Um, you know, I'm missing other things. So when you, when you kind of banish people from one circle after another of regularly placed public institutions that, you know, people in Chicago 400, most are people are parents. Um, you know, they have kids also, their kids are affected by this, but when you banish someone from all of those places, there's nowhere left, but people are still our neighbors. They still live. Mm -hmm. And what happens is their families then become homeless or they have to make a decision. Should I be homeless with my child or should I just not live with my child and the family separates? So I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Terrence, to that. And Lori, while we're waiting, if Terrence doesn't want to jump in, that's um, fine. Yes, I would just like to add that we do have a bill that um Lo that we're describing in the bill we are asking uh once to end weekly registration um uh, with that um we want to go yearly or just in periodically. I know that would be like a hot pill to swallow and two we just asking to reduce the housing benchment laws from five hundred feet to two hundred fifty feet that give us closure and to be able to um stay in our houses without being um, evicted or have to leave if somebody decided to open up a, a daycare or um, any, uh, anything else in that nature that we won't be forced to um, leave, leave our house and that we'll be able to, um, you know, reunite with our kids because, you know, it's one thing to affect us as human beings who being put in this situation that we did our time, but it's another thing to how the society or the, the world to reject us from being able to be with our kids. So we just asking for those two things in our bill. The bill is HB 39. I think Logan Joe has it. She can put it in the group, um, in the chat. And um, that's all I have to say on that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, let's see, let's go through a couple other questions here. Um, there was a question talking about having worked in prisons and keeping um, the incarcerators have harmed themselves as the prisoners they incarcerated. So what I'm, I guess I'd like a little more explanation on what is, does anybody understand what that question means? I guess I, um, I can share Go ahead. I'll let you go. You, you go ahead. Okay, I'll go because I think we just keep going back and forth, so you go. So I guess, all right, so I can speak from personal experience, right? I guess what it's saying is that um, that the guards hurt themselves almost at a rate higher, higher, I mean, almost at the similar rate as people that are incarcerated. And I can contest to that. Um, from the time that I was incarcerated in the, the penitentiary that I was here, I think that three or four COs took their own life. Um, and it's unfortunate because of the, the high stakes, the stressful situation, and they see the, uh, the, the vicarious trauma. So they actually see the trauma that's going on and have to like relive that. And so, and a lot of, a lot of these COs were like in the, um, was, were in the position where they couldn't do anything. Like the one particular CO that I could really think of, I won't say his name, but he was really for higher education in prison. And he did not understand why the administration was treating the program like the way they were. And so I don't I wanna I don't wanna say that played a huge role into him taking this life, but all the thing I can say is that a person has, or several people that I know have. Interesting. Okay. All right. Do we have Let's see here. I look at the chat real quick, see if we have any other questions coming up there from attendees. Um, I don't. 
I don't see anything there. Um, so I, I would like to ask Chastity just a, a question. Um, so one of the things I think that's very helpful uh, from what we're doing with community conversations is by bringing it local in, in, in that so that we do see the differences uh, between uh, you know all the different parts of the state and, and Chassie, how are you addressing that to, to allow people in whether in Southern Illinois or Northern Illinois to relate to the topics that you're discussing? So I think um, like I agree with you I think it's really important um, especially in Southern Illinois like that's why our work is like focused on the local area because sometimes people will say, um, oh, that doesn't happen here. You know, like, um, especially like, um, there was an issue with the school resource officer at Carbondale Community High School in our community. And people would say, oh, you know, there's not a school to prison pipeline or that's not an issue in our schools, but that's not true. Um, and so to have a conversation and just, bring these are your neighbors you know these are your friends these are your community members so when you bring that conversation to a local level and you understand yes it does happen here it's affecting our community and if we can have this hard conversations bring people together then that's how we create change okay thank you um from the q a from what um, the Southern region doesn't think, uh, the, the questioner says, from the Southern region, I don't think has much programming. I know Southwestern Illinois does or did. What other prisons in the Southern region provide any type of program? And we may not have anybody on here today to answer that question. I, I think this is Beth speaking and I can answer a little bit. I was part of Southern Illinois Reentry Group for many years. And I worked also with Lutheran Social Services who had a program for reentry. Um, someone else had mentioned, I think it was Dora Weaver mentioned Lutheran Social Services. And I did that as, as part of my function with the public media system at Southern Illinois University. And, and I do want to say that I think that higher ed, um, that your organization can reach um, into S Southern Illinois University for support and assistance. Um, and I think that there are connections to be made here, very practical and tangible connections to be made. Um, my experience relates to the juvenile justice system in Harrisburg um, there is Harrisburg, Illinois is the location for the Illinois Youth Center. And um, there are young men from age roughly 13, I think all the way up to 21 in that facility. When I um, did work on behalf of public media in that facility uh, several years ago, they had a census of nearly 400 uh, youngsters or young adults and the, of those 40, 40 were parents. And um, that's why I went in there to talk to those young men and work with them and to provide resources and education and more than just a nice to have or make, you know, make their circumstance better. It was supposed to be very practical. Um, and anyway, there were 40 young people Average reading level was about fourth grade. Um, the youngest parent was 17 and he had three children by three different baby mamas, as he said to me. I cannot tell you how transformed I was by my experience over 10 weeks teaching in that institution. But the IYC Harrisburg is its own school district and it's really more controlled by the Department of Corrections than it is by the Illinois State Board of Ed. But at that time, Melva Clarida was the principal and she had a pretty much progressive reform agenda in, I wanna say in spite of the warden, maybe that's not representing it correctly, but she had her row to hoe, so to speak, with the warden in getting you know, the, the programs in there. 
And I was able to work with the other educators in that facility also, and found them to be more or less caring as I think it was um, Margaret Henry or someone else was talking, maybe Dora was talking about, you know, the guards also kind of being the neighbors and, and this and that. So I just, I want to say that there was programming in there. Um, there was a lot of work done down here as it relates to re-entry. And I believe it has been sustained to some degree. Um, but this is the work of care and concern. And I don't know if I helped you all by offering that, um, but it's tough to get programs in because of the trends, you know, it depends on who the warden is and then it's trendy and then it goes away or the money, you know, the money flows there, here, there and yonder. But I'm glad that we're able to connect each other together today. Absolutely. So we also have a question now asking if anyone would like to address the role of the existence of the prison industrial complex in keeping mass incarceration. That's, that's a big one. I don't know if anybody filled up to that one. I mean, I can try. I mean, that's all I can say is that I just think that we live in a capitalistic society. I mean, I think that says it all, right? So you follow the money. So if, as long as there's money that's going to be involved into the um, truly the enslavement of people, it's always going to be it's always going to be around. So until we figure out a way not to monetize this thing, that's the only way I think that we can upset it. Um, and I think uh, also to add what I think that was Beth was saying. Uh, there are other programs in like Southern Illinois, but I think there are a lot of community colleges and like, um, and there are GED programs. So just to like clarify that, I just, uh, there aren't any, there aren't too many. I don't want to say any because there could be some that I'm not aware of, of higher education and prison programs. Okay. All right. I want to go and talk just a little bit about restorative justice. Say oh, I'm one, sorry. Just with the, the prison industrial complex question, and th there's so much to say about that, right? I do want to point out that Illinois doesn't have private prisons. And so I think what's always important for us to understand, as I'm sure Dora does, um, is that there are so many ways uh, for uh, people and entities to make money off of incarceration. And so um, I think oftentimes in mainstream media, the flashy headlines are about private prisons and we need to think in a much, much more broad and complex way. And I think, you know, this is something Larry and I were trying to flag with thinking about Pell Grants coming back and thinking about um, the risk of, while this is an incredible opportunity, there also is a risk for um, higher ed to become part even more of that prison industrial complex if it turns into job creation for educators or um, you know, ways to be managing Pell Grants for incarcerated people. So I appreciate the question. Um, and Lori, Joe, I know you said you have something to say too. Well, I was gonna say something similar, um, but I guess I just also don't want us to feel a sense of defeat because of the fact that we live under capitalism or any other fact, because really what's at play here is this is our state and our state is paying for this and our, our state is paying for these prisons. Of course, we don't have private prisons. We have other privatized um, services, but we're paying for the public prisons. We're paying for, um, we're paying for 23,000 re-registrations of homeless people of 450 homeless people a year. So, you know, in Chicago, people, you know, our, our resources, our public safety resources are being spent on re-registering people who are homeless. You know, we're, our public safety resources are spent on people who are incredible, incredible people who have changed their lives in spite of being in prison, still stuck in prison, you know, we're so these are this is statecraft this is us deciding what the purpose of our state should be and what we're doing and i mean we we live we were living under capitalism in the 1970s and we had so many less people in prison we did not have registries we did not have housing banishment laws people were actually free when they got out 
I'm not saying the 70s were perfect <laughs> at all. There were a lot of problems, but if we could get back to the 70s, that would be amazing. I mean, that would be like unbelievable in terms of our prison system. So we shouldn't feel defeatist. We should feel like this is our state and how, what do we want our state to be doing? Should it be damaging people's lives? You know, no. Um, but it is also true that, and this is what's wonderful about um, Chez and Larry's project, you know, it is also true that people, we have really high inequality and rural areas are struggling and people feel like they need prisons, you know, and they do need jobs and they do need money, you know, and so what is it, what do we want our state to be doing? I want our state to do rural economic development that's truly helpful for people and not damaging. There's many, many people in rural areas and small towns who are deeply damaged by the prison system. So really this is about us deciding what we want our state to be doing, whatever system we've got. Yeah, Chez, did you have a comment as, as well on the industry? Sorry, I was trying to type and uh, I, I just, yes to what Lori Joe was saying. And I think that point is, is so critical because it goes back to the earlier point that Larry was speaking to about, you know, um, correctional officers working in these facilities. Like this is a moment to imagine. So how do we create, as Lori, Lori Joe was just highlighting for us, life affirming industries and economic opportunity, right? How do we create uh, the state that we want, the world that we want, where nobody's livelihood is tied to caging a person and dehumanizing per a person day in and day out. And so, you know, th that's the opportunity. And, and yes, we have to recognize the deep financial and, you know, and economic insecurity that so many people are suffering. Um, and as Laurie, Laurie Joe is saying, that's statecraft, right? Like that insecurity is by design. Um, and so, you know, how do we kind of break through that false divide where some people think that their safety and economic security is tied to, you know, caging human beings? We, we have to reject that and think in a more complex life affirming way about what does, you know, safety actually look and feel like and what does economic security actually look and feel like? Yeah, and I think what Larry was saying too, that was interesting. I've never heard uh, in prior to the day about the uh, statistic that correctional officers that hurt themselves um, and it is much, you know, they're walking in every day to the same facility and either not liking what they see. And I, I think um, what I thought also related to this from the Philly DA uh, film was that one of the conversations that uh, District Attorney Krasner said is ha pressing his prosecutors, I, th I think the way he said it is that he was going to press the prosecutors to justify why housing someone, and I think in his case, they may have said $42,000 a year. How does that help the victim as well? You know, and, and I think that's almost a tie, Kira, to the uh, restorative justice. It, is putting someone in prison and spending forty dollars or $50,000 a year, does it really help the victim? Does it really help our society? And that's a question I've never heard asked before either. It, we, no one, I've never seen anybody ask, well, is it why are we spending this much money and who are we helping with that? That's a perfect segue into, you know, a, a comment about restorative justice. And um, this was actually, you know, a portion of my dissertation uh, that, that I'm still finishing up here. And one of the things that I even had to learn along the way, so I've been doing criminal justice, you know, uh, diversion and, and, and everything since uh, 20, uh, 2007. And in 2015, I made this complete shift, right? And the shift was, is this restorative? Because it sure doesn't feel like it, even though we're calling it restorative, right? So mm -hmm. to your point, uh, uh, Byron, one of the things that we don't do in the criminal justice system, we never ask the victims. We ne we've never, it is not even rocket science. We never ask them. And so a lot of times people, you know, will say things like, I don't want them to go to jail or prison. I just want to know why. Why did they do this to me? I was minding my own business. My husband was minding his, my wife was minding, you know, they, they were all minding their own business. Yet you came up and took my purse. Why me? Now I couldn't pay the bills or now I couldn't do this or that. And sometimes what happens in other countries is they will provide the space for those who have been affected and, and, and those who've been victimized to actually have conversation and dialogue with those who committed the offense. And believe it or not, they solve it 
outside of a court system. The issue that we are so used to in the Western, uh, the, the Western society, we're so used to the autocratic response, which is where there's a, a, there's a single entity in charge of making these kinds of decisions and telling us what justice is. Um, and so in this case, we are, we're, we're talking about a courtroom, right? And, and we understand what courts are and what their functions are, we get it. However, in, in many situations, the judge never needed to be involved. The courts never needed to be involved. Law enforcement was there, they handled what they needed to handle, and then it went to the courtroom because it's designed to do that. But at what point are we able to, to have these conversations in our individual communities about having additional responses rather than the traditional response. <laughs> so, so that's basically how you know we we want to exactly yes I see the comments. Um, so this is this is the reason that the GRJP is having these kinds of conversations and encouraging everyone in their communities to get involved with these kinds of conversations because justice to you is not justice to someone else. Absolutely. Right? So, um, but that, but again, the short answer to your question is, is, does it, does it take 45 years and chopping off an arm to make sure that someone feels like there's some kind of justice? Did we ever even ask? Did you ask? Did we ask? What a great, what a great way to, to kind of wrap up our, our conversation panel here. Um, and I, I think that's what I love about this and what I need more of is because I can't form, you know, I can go off of opinions that I have without any knowledge. And then we end up in situations like this, we, if we never ask. And I think one of the questions that, you know, in a future panel, it, whatever any of you get to participate in, certainly one that I will uh, be asking myself is something that came from what you just said and from what uh, what's showing on Philly DA is asking the question of our state's attorneys or district attorneys, um, do we, why are, you know, we've built a metric, I think, on our, who we want to elect based on their conviction rate. Um, and maybe a better way to look is, and, and I don't know this, but is to do what you're saying, ask the victims. Are your victims satisfied with the justice instead of just worrying about pure convictions? You know, that, that seems like so much better of a question to ask, you know, did your victim get an answer that they wanted answered? rather than we put someone in prison for 40 years or whatever else. So uh, thank you so much, everyone. I think we've gone a little longer. So we'll give Beth and uh, a chance to wrap everything up. And I really appreciate it. Um, I, I, I desperately believe that more conversations are the way to help all of us understand and get to a place where uh, these conversations become something that have happened and not something that are happening to us today. Thank you so much. All right, and uh, I think we've opened some doors actually, and maybe started to form some new relationships and connections that will inform us and make us stronger in our quest um, to overcome criminal injustice. I'm grateful to all of you for participating today. And I just wanna put in a plug for the next film coming up. Uh, which is called The Donut King, and it has to do with refugees, and um, it will take place Sunday, May 23rd at 2.30 p.m. It will be a virtual event just like this. Um, Byron, thank you for uh, your work to include comments about the film, and I do believe that we will learn from watching Philly DA, so I encourage you to tune in or check out the website. Um, and if you would like more information, you may reach out to me. My name is Beth Spasia and I work for WSIU. With that, I think we have come to 